born a fisherman, always been a fisherman. True enough. Fish lover. Uh, we did his bachelor's at UC Santa Barbara. He was actually a student in the photography class from Greg Clare, was the TA of that class. In the Pony Express was, uh, days. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> ben Milton did his master's and his PhD at UCSD. Uh, he left for a little while, was in uh, uh, Third Ox General College. Yeah. Teaching a little bit and running the Van Cleaner Research Institute. Yeah. And then decided to call him, called him back to Santa Barbara. And he's been there ever since as a research professor. And he has a very long and illustrious career. Uh, mainly long, focused, anyway. Yes. <laughs> mainly for the rock fishers and other fishers along the, the Pacific Coast. Uh, he's written innumerable plus scientific publications. Sure. Hundreds of popular press articles. He's uh, been the science writer for a number of major journals and, and other things. And he's quite prolific. He's written a number of uh, very important And now the new book is certainly more than you want to know about the fishing of the Pacific Coast. Right on. Uh, chock full of really good uh, kind of history that you can easily and likely find out on the internet. Sure. And we even have potentially a few more copies left. I, I have. Be willing to part with. I have. W oh, 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 whoa. Um, I have one copy left. Some people um, signed up for them. Did they all get them? It, anybody who signed up did not get a copy. One more did not get a copy. Oh, okay. So here's the deal. That, that's the last book, but, but no, wait. I don't want anybody urinating in their pants over this. So the deal is, or, or you can. L listen, I'm a libertarian. You want to pee in your pants, it's fine. Uh, there should be no laws against it. Um, so here's what I'll do. Sign up, I mean, just give me some money. Give me 20 bucks, and your name and address, and uh, I'll mail it to you, and I won't charge you the, the, the shipping fee, OK? Because I got to get rid of these damn books. So okay, <laughs> so there you go. For right. those of you that are interested in fishing in any way whatsoever, sure. You could have this book. shape or form. Yes, yeah. and it's written in men's textbook, humorous, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you without love further it. ado, uh, right. Milton's going to be talking today about what the golden years and a little yellow <laughs> submarine or something like that. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. Big whatever. Populations and oil platforms. Yeah. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, Am I on? I mean, am I, I mean, am I turned on? I mean, I'm turned on, of course, but <laughs> is my mic on? No one knows. No one cares. Is it? That's all I care about. Okay, as long as you guys are happy, that's all. So, um, so in 1995, uh, I, I'm, I'm on soft money at the university, which means if I don't bring in contracts, uh, I don't get paid. And after a while, the university goes like, why are you here? Who are you? Why are you here? And uh, around 1995, the uh, business manager of the biology department came into my office and started measuring my office, right, <laughs> without talking to me. That's not a good sign. So he, he was like, I wasn't, he was pretending I wasn't there. So that's because I had no money. I wasn't bringing money. And uh, I got a call from a guy uh, at the National Biological Survey that uh, Clinton had just set it up. And uh, he said, uh, this is Lyman Thorstensen. Uh, he said, uh, you Milton Love? I said, yeah. He said, uh, uh, if you had money to do rockfish research, what would you do? Like, uh -huh. and no one calls you with money, <laughs> right? As you guys probably know, all of us are not unlike some little beggar boy in a Dickensian novel, right? Please, sir, could I have some ghoul, sir? You know, it's like that, right? And it's horrible. And so, someone calling you with money. So my first thought was, and I said, like, who are you? <laughs> and he said, I'm Lyman Thorstenson. Uh, MBS just got created. I got a whole bunch of money that was ripped out of the Minerals Management Service. And I'd kind of like to do the kind of research they're interested in. They mentioned you might have something interesting. What would you do? And I said, well, I'd like to write a book on rockfish. He said, oh, that's good. And uh, I'm interested in the fishes that live around oil platforms off California, because really no one had, had done much work. And he said, yeah, that's kind of interesting. Uh, he said, what would you do? And I said, well, I'd, I'd probably uh, do scuba surveys in the, the top parts. And then I'd use a little two-person submarine in the bottom parts. And, he, and I said, how much money have you got? He said, I can't tell you that. I went, OK. He said, but isn't the submarine stuff expensive? And I said, well, it's about $6,500 a day. And he said, oh, that's not expensive. And I'm going like, <laughs> <laughs> it's 
you're my new best friend, man. <laughs> Holy shit, man. <laughs> so, uh, and that was the start of uh, 17 years of research around uh, platforms in, in, in California. And, and the rationale for even uh, doing the research is that there are 26 platforms of ca off California. Eventually, all of them become uneconomical to operate. These are like business ventures. It's not that there's no oil or gas left. Uh, it's just that at, the, at the, whatever the cost is of oil or gas, the companies can't make any money. And at some point, legally, contractually, they have to tell the federal government if the, if the platform is in federal waters, three miles or more from shore, or the state government, inshore waters, they have to just say, hey, we're done. And they ha there's about a year-long process where a decision is made, what are you going to do with the platform? Well, we'll just pick a platform. And there are various things you can do. You can, and it ranges all the way from complete removal of the platform, and that's explosive removal. Basically, you drop charges down the, the legs of it, and you blow them up. At least you blow them free. And uh, that kills all the fish. And uh, you pull the platform out of the water, and you haul the platform to shore. It's all made out of steel. You can recycle the steel and so forth. So that's at one extreme, complete removal. And then at the other end, in theory, could leave them all in place above the water line. It costs about $500,000 a year to maintain a platform uh, with the cathodic protection so they don't rust away and, and all the navigational aids and so forth. But then in between, there are other things uh, that have been done historically. You can tip them over. These are all things like acting, uh, uh, perpetuating the debris. You can tip them over. You can tow them someplace else after blowing them up, kind of a, a, an area of artificial reef. Or you can top them some distance below the water. So very few platforms off California have been decommissioned, about four of them. And that was done before anyone started going like, well, are these important structures as far as fishes or invertebrates are concerned? So the research that I've been uh, paid to do, our lab has been paid to do, it, uh, all goes toward answering questions about, are these important habitats for fishes or for invertebrates or for whatever? And that may uh, funnel into the decision as to what to do with each platform. Now, of course, the reality, the way politics work is that whoever, you know, whatever side screams the loudest and whines the most will probably win, right? And uh, it's, at least in Southern California, these are very, very contentious uh, issues. There are people who despise the oil industry and who despise oil platforms, who think that anything artificial in the ocean is inherently wrong. And they don't care about any scientific findings. I mean, that's just their frame of reference, which is all perfectly fine. And then uh, at the extreme opposite, there are people who view these platforms as humongous reefs and are, are asking themselves, well, why are we blowing these things up if they're fully functioning reefs? So you have, and then everything in between. So when the next time around, when some company goes, well, uh, we're done, there's going to be you know, an immense amount of yelling and screaming. And whether my data will play into the decision, like ain't nobody knows, but on the other hand, I'm not living under a bridge, so I'm perfectly happy to keep supplying information to people. And that's my entire job. And I always tell people uh, that I wear two hats as, as uh, in, in this field. There's Milton Love, the biologist, who just gives people facts. And that's uh, anybody, so all the same facts. And then there's myself as a citizen, and I actually do have uh, an opinion about what should be done with platforms, and I always feel I should tell people what that is. And basically, uh, when you remove a platform, you not only kill all the fish, through explosion, but you kill all the hundreds of millions or billions of animals that, that live on the platform, all the um, sea stars and crabs and, and mussels and so forth. And I just view that as immoral, killing all those animals, just because they happen to be living on something artificial. But that's just a, that view I try to separate from what I'm going to present today. So basically, what I'm going to show you today is kind of an abbreviated version of, of some of the things that over the last 15, 17 years that we have kind of figured out about the platforms in California. This is just a placeholder. It has nothing to do with platforms. This is uh, Spassi's uh, simulator, and it's, I'm a big rockfish fan, so there you go. Uh, let's see. Doo -doo -doo. That one? No. Obviously not that one. Mm, the arrows. Which arrow is there? That arrow? Good. OK. So um, oh, good. Which one? That one? That one. Okay. 
So um, 26 platforms off California. They range in depth, uh, bottom depth, from uh, about 15 meters of water uh, to about 340 meters of water. Wide range of depths and a wide range of sizes. The deeper the platform, the bigger the, pl the, uh, the deeper the water, the bigger the platform. Some of these platforms are, when you're on them, are like humongous. They're bigger than football fields. Really big, 14, 18 stories tall, some of them. Uh, very, very large uh, structures, almost all of them fabricated in Korea and towed across the Pacific and then dropped uh, off our coast. Um, they're complete, uh, once you get to the waterline, they're completely made out of steel. Above the waterline, the, the housing and so forth, there's some concrete and plastic and so forth. That would all be removed. No matter what happens to a platform, the very first thing is, is that everything on the top side is removed and all of the um, corrosive materials on there are removed until you're left with this steel jacket. And that's what the argument is, is about. What do you do with these uh, steel jackets? Ooh, I can use that. So here's who the um, research has been funded by. Most of it has been funded by the Minerals Management Service, which is now called the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Uh, the Biological Resources Division of the U.S. Geological Survey, they started the funding. And then a little bit comes uh, indirectly from the oil industry. I always like to tell everybody, where does the funding come? And uh, I'd say about 10% came from CARE, and uh, CARE was created entirely by the oil industry. It's an NGO, but all the money comes from CARE. So basically, about 10% of my funding was laundered uh, oil company money. And uh, basically, uh, the money was sent to a Paraguayan uh, uh, cattle ranch, turned into hamburger, uh, sold to the Russian mafia. They converted it into gold, and then in the Moscow airport, I went to a locker and got the gold. <laughs> Just want to be completely uh, transparent about this. And uh, because there are people, there is a one particular person, an environmental lawyer in Santa Barbara, who goes around the state, or used to, saying that I'm a liar because my funding came from the oil industry. So 10% uh, of it does. So only 10% of this is a lie, which is, in science, not bad, right? I mean, it's, fairly good as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so basically when we started the research, uh, this is kind of the questions we were asking. What fishes live around platforms and over nearby natural reefs? And the big question everybody asks, um, when you see fishes at a platform, are you looking at examples of aggregation? That is, uh, were the fishes someplace else, someplace natural, and they were uh, attracted to the platform? Or, and or, uh, were the platforms actually, uh, are the platforms producing fish? Are there more fish in the system because the platform was there? Or did you just reorient uh, them so that they're now around your platform, but they used to be someplace else? <coughs> you look at a platform, and uh, as I say, it's, it's all steel. Uh, this is the typical kind of intertidal zone. So what you see as far as invertebrates are concerned, you see a very, very thick uh, muscle coating that goes down to about 100 feet of, uh, I guess we'll do meters, because you're all meter people. I just came from a foot people. So uh, <laughs> down to about 30 meters of water, uh, you see primarily mussels and all the animals that are associated uh, with mussels, sea stars and, and Corynactus uh, and the like, and amphipods and all that. Uh, and then you, get to, you tend to get a band of uh, Corynactus uh, uh, club anemones from about 30 meters, and you know, it's interspersed with other things, but 30 meters down to maybe 80 meters, you get an awful lot of club anemones, and uh, mixed in with uh, brittle stars, you know, it's just uh, anything you kind of expect, meter brain. And then down there at the bottom, this is the bottom of the platform, uh, you tend to see very, very large metridiums, uh, white anemones, and uh, sponges and, and animals like that. Uh, th this is a very typical, I, I'll just kind of show you this, because this is typically what a platform looks like at the bottom. They're all designed to have a very large cross beam right at the bottom of the platform. It, they knew what depth it would be, they built the platform to that depth. Uh, in some cases, the, the cross beam has been covered over, you know, silted over or shelled over by muscles, and in some cases, in, as in this case, it's actually been undercut by currents, which forms a long cave, and that tends to be at the, pl uh, the bottom where you tend to see really big fish sheltering in the, the bottom of the, uh, the platform. And then around each platform, there is a unique habitat made up of the shells that have fallen off the platform. This is the so-called shell mound. And uh, the shells fall off either during cleaning operations. The oil companies will clean, have the platforms clean down to about 
20 meters, 30 meters of water, all of those fall down to the bottom. And, or during gales, big uh, gale of wind events and swell events, they'll fall down. And so you get all of these shells that, for, that form essentially a, a very low but rugose uh, bottom. So it's, it's not like high relief, but it's kind of low relief. And uh, all kinds of invertebrates uh, are found there, uh, lots and lots of sea stars. These, um, it's a real nursery ground for crabs. These are rock crabs. Each one of these is the size of a half dollar to give you an idea of sometimes the density of these uh, young crabs. Spot prawns on some of them. So the, most of the research I'm going to talk about today, uh, we did in the Delta, which is a two-person sub. Here's Mary Yaklovich, my uh, co-conspirator there. Uh, this was done, uh, this picture was taken during the uh, uh, Bush administration. We all had to have a, uh, this was actually a French cook. For some reason, even though it was old France, we had to have a, a French cook. And, uh, and uh, this is an untethered sub. So uh, once it's released, it's on its own. Uh, um, it, it's free to operate however it wants. Basically, the observer kind of squunched down and looked out this port. And this camera, this video camera, basically filmed what the observer saw. There were two lasers, ruby lasers on each side. They were 20 centimeters apart. So when we looked out the port, you could see a two dots 20 centimeters apart and you can then align your eye and figure out how big the fish were that you saw as they went by. We would try to identify every single fish that went by between us and two meters out. So we did the belt transect. It was two meters that way and then two meters from the seafloor uh, up. And when we, when we went around the platform, basically we would come down to the bottom of the platform. You'd go all the way around it, count all the fish. First, you'd actually come out to the shell mound. So you'd go all the way around and do a shell mound transect. Came over here went up to the next cross beam, next cross beam, until you basically, if you could, um, got to the top cross beam, which is usually in about 10 meters, 8 to 10 meters of water. Sometimes we could do it, sometimes not. But we also had um, scuba surveys that went down to about 35 meters. So we covered, uh, we double covered the upper parts of water column. These are all the platforms. Uh, if it has a star on it, we, sur we have surveyed it with the sub. We also uh, surveyed Gina, which is in shallow water. Chris Lowe's people at Long Beach State did these two. And the one we never got to, I think, is Heritage. Those three up there, Heritage, Harmony, and Hondo, are owned by Exxon. The only, those are the only three platforms owned by Exxon. And uh, Exxon is, uh, they're a bunch of fascists. There's, I mean, that's all. I, when I first started working, uh, the first 1995, I had to call all the oil industry companies that own platforms and just kind of explain our research. And I called the one that owned the one way up there, Irene, uh, which was Torch, you know, a small company. And I explained it to John Deacon, the guy and, who was the operator. And I explained, and he went, OK. And I thought, all right, that's great, man. <laughs> and then I called Exxon, and they said, no. And I explained it. We're not going to go inside the. the the, the jacket just outside takes an hour. No. And finally, a couple years later, after a bunch of no's, their lawyer talked to UCSB's lawyer and MMS's lawyer, and the lawyer said, Exxon's lawyer, what part of no don't you understand, is what she said. And eventually, it took us 12 years, but we, you know, they grudgingly gave us permission to, to do those. You think they were like, it's like, what are they doing there? It's like a huge meth lab, kind of. <laughs> so. That's the reason they're the biggest corporation in the world, uh, you know, clearly. So, and then we've also done lots and lots of natural research because you have to have a frame of reference if you're going to talk about platforms. And these, all these dots show all of the natural reefs, natural areas that we've done in Southern California. Basically, the only place that we haven't done much is uh, down in here. There's some big reefs there, and that's just too far for us uh, to go in a couple places, can't go many. But basically, we have a really good frame of reference for the fishes that live on reefs, natural reefs. And the thing to remember uh, th that's kind of the elephant in the, in the room is that there's been massive overfishing uh, throughout Southern California on, on reefs out, well, I mean, this is it. This is the end of the continental shelf right there. And uh, mostly you see fish that are smaller than about 18 centimeters long, even on reefs way out there that have really good habitat. They should have big fish. And we're talking mainly about rockfish. And uh, this is overfishing that's decades old, and it's, it's not just commercial fishermen, but there are millions of recreational anglers in Southern California. And uh, rec boats can do just as much havoc 
because uh, they kind of pound the same reefs. I was actually in that industry, so I know. They pound the same reefs over and over again, day after day, and they can just depress a population, a group of populations down real fast. So, so basically, we see a lot of very, very small fish out on these, even on these outer banks. And, and the uh, kind of the take home message uh, that, that we got from platforms is that as far as fishes are concerned, not all the platforms uh, are created equal. But if someone held uh, a gun to my head and said, well, you have to kind of generalize, this is kind of what we would see. The upper parts of the platforms have uh, a pelagic component, uh, which means that the fishes are just coming through. These are uh, um, sardines, and they just waft through. They're not, uh, the platform is not apparently particularly important to them. There are lots and lots of uh, kind of shallow, typically shallow Southern California fishes living in the shallows, uh, Garibaldi's and sheephead's and uh, lots of, of cabazon uh, that nest on the, usually on the cross beams. And then uh, the, the most important thing, at least from, uh, probably from a manager's standpoint, is that um, many platforms, but not all of them, are, uh, harbor very high densities of young of the year rock fishes in some years, as do natural reefs. Right? There's uh, good years, there's bad years, oceanographic conditions vary, so you can't predict it, but in, in a number of years, uh, these are uh, juvenile boccaccio, for instance, overfish species. This is platform uh, gilda, and uh, there's just a, a very high number. And we'll, we'll kind of come back to that nursery function uh, in a moment. Um, if you look at, uh, by the way, so that's densities of yoi rock fishes. Yoi means, for a few of you, young of the year. So these are less than a year old fish. These are the fishes that are, are most representative of what's happened out in the uh, uh, oceanic environment, uh, whether it was good or bad for survivorship. So um, uh, this is kind of the take home message in, on one of these is the importance of long term data sets. So if we just look at uh, essentially baby Boccaccio at one, one platform, platform Grace, years running along uh, the x axis, the higher the red bar, the more there are of, of uh, the species, the higher the density. And you know, if, if I had three years worth of money, 96 through 98, and uh, someone had said to me afterwards, well, is platform grace an important nursery ground for Boccaccio? I'd go like, no, we never saw one. But come 1999, which was uh, a very good year for a lot of young rock fishes, water was cold, upwelling it seemed to occur at just the right time. Uh, there were very high density. We're talking hundreds of thousands of, of the, these fish. And then you can see it just kind of varies from case to case. So um, there's a lack of predictability, is what I'm saying, in the midwater community as far as the nursery function. Some years are real good. Some years are real bad. Some years, lots of Boccaccio, but very few blues. Other years, lots of blues, uh, very few Boccaccio. So it's highly variable. At the bottom of the platform, there's a different assemblage of fishes. And depending on the depth, it's uh, just like a natural reef. So, uh, but the, the generality is you tend to find larger fishes. They tend to be rock fishes again, uh, and they tend to be subadults or adults. So um, here's an example. These are, um, well, they're either vermilion rockfish or sunset rockfish. We at one time thought they're the same species, and you can't tell them apart apparently when they're young. But this is a, a kind of a typical assemblage of subadults found at one particular uh, platform. Uh, flag rockfish uh, at platform Grace. Right at the bottom, here's the cross beam, there's the shell mound. They like that little crevice. If you go around the other side of the platform, there's no flag rockfish because the, there is no crevice there. It's all been uh, shelled in. So, uh, and it's very predictable. Year after year after year, you come to this side of this platform and there's always these adult flag rockfish. Much more predictable system. Boccaccio, the only, one of the only places that we see high densities of this overfish species, high densities of adults, is at one particular platform it probably, it, it sits in the right depth, and uh, fishing is, uh, pressure is less at most platforms, and we'll come back to that. And cow cod, I actually have a tattoo of a cow cod, uh, but I'd have to pull down my pants to show it. No, I have, have it on my arm. Um, so cow cod uh, overfish down to about 2 or 3% of its unfished levels. The highest densities in Southern California uh, on any site is one particular platform. Lots and lots of link cod on, on some of them also. Um, so so if, the, if the nursery function in the midwater of platforms is unpredictable from year to year, 
the assemblage at the bottom, again mainly rockfish, is very predictable from year to year at every platform. So again, flag rockfish, there's Hidalgo in a number of years. There's always good numbers of flags. On the other hand, if you go to Irene, you almost never see any. The difference is Irene is in water almost too shallow for flag rockfish. Hidalgo sits right in the sweet spot for flag rockfish. So this is kind of a depth phenomenon. But you can do this for fish after species after species. Uh, the bottom assemblage is very, very predictable. And then the shell mounds have a third assemblage of fishes, again, depending on the, the, the bottom depth. And it tends to be of species that are associated with low relief, not um, mud, but low and hard relief, because that's what the shells kind of form. This is a spawning aggregation of California scorpion fish found around one of the platforms. Uh, you tend to get um, large, this, these are ha uh, half banded, uh, large numbers of dwarf species, because there's not a lot of places to hide in a shell mound, there's, there's little bits. So you're not gonna expect to see like meter long fish trying to hide in a, in a crevice that's this big, right? But something like a half banded, which you know one on steroids is like uh, 20 centimeters long. So uh, you tend to see tens of thousands of those around the shell mounds. And then you see the juveniles of a lot of uh, uh, fish that eventually wind up on high relief. So you tend to find uh, juvenile uh, ling cod, and there's a little juvenile cow cod that's probably you know, like that long. Uh, and this is like one of the best places to find them is in, in these uh, extended, uh, we're talking like hectare or two hectare uh, extended uh, shell mounds around platforms. So if you compare platforms and, and reefs as far as fish assemblages are concerned, um, you do find differences. So uh, without going into uh, agonizing uh, discussion of this, this is basically uh, the typical fishes that we see on platforms, the shallow, uh, relatively shallow water platforms at the bottom versus shallow reefs. So basically everything, all the species from here to just above my finger, those are all typical um, shallow bottom platform species. And then the smaller numbers up there are typical shallow water reef species. Now by shallow I'm talking uh, I think, how did I rank, I think this is like 40 meters to about uh, 80 meters of water, okay? And you can see, first of all, there's a lot more species that you tend to find around platforms than around the reef. And the species in yellow are the, inv uh, are the economically important ones. So not only are there more species, but there are more economically important ones. And the, the rationale there, or the, I think what the reason is, is that the platforms act as de facto marine reserves. They're not, they weren't set up that way, they were set up to pump oil and gas. But the amount of fishing pressure around a typical platform is much less than around a typical reef. First of all, uh, the, since 9-11, the owners ar around most platforms, they don't like any boats around, because they don't know if you're Osama. Well, you can't be Osama now. But <laughs> until recently, you could be Osama. I actually asked the guy who was, he, was, he didn't own the company, but he, he was uh, the platform supervisor, and, and he said, no, we don't like these little boats coming in. I'm going like, so is it reasonable that Osama would come in in a skiff and, and drift by you fishing? I mean, wouldn't he just slam in and blow your plate? Uh, no, it didn't, no effect, no effect. So anyway, so, so this is to a certain extent um, a, um, a fishing pressure effect. And th this holds up not just in this depth, but in deep water. Um, there's so much fishing pressure on, historically, on uh, reefs and relatively little on platforms that the, the fishes that wind up on platform bottoms tend to be protected a bit more than on uh, natural reefs. So I actually looked at that. So uh, I asked the question, in all the surveys we did, where are the large rock fishes? And I defined that uh, as larger than 30 centimeters. And because 30 centimeters, in my experience as a commercial fisherman and as a sport fisherman, about 30 centimeters is where hooks can start catching a preponderance of fish, not all of them, but uh, many of them, and uh, gill nets uh, around 30 centimeters. So that seemed reasonable, so I uh, just asked that question. And basically, um, again, each one of these dots is a, a site that, that rockfish inhabit. These are not like mud bottoms or whatever. This is all done from our submersible work. 
And uh, the closer the dot is to red, the higher the density of, this is all fishes now, greater than 30 centimeters. And then if a, there's an X, it meant that in the entire survey, which is about 1,200 meters long, we didn't see a single fish bigger than 30 centimeters. So uh, it's kind of hit and miss, but there's very few red ones. Uh, there's a platform. Uh, that's the one uh, platform, Gale, that has the Calcods and Big Boccaccio. There's a, a couple of orange ones up there. One platform, it, it, it like blows like crazy up there, so there's less fishing pressure. And like one spot there. And then there's just a whole bunch of Xs. And these are, uh, these are sites that, based on our knowledge of uh, rockfish behavior and, and, and habitat preference, uh, they should have big fish, and they don't have big fish. So that's almost certainly a fishing effect that, that we're seeing there. And the other one is the nursery effect. So, so what I, I did was I compared all the data we had from this platform, Platform Hidalgo, and that reef uh, there, North Reef. And then the, the advantage there is that we always did the submersible surveys on those two sites on the same day, right? So there was no day effect or season effect or anything like that. They're in about the same bottom depth, right? They're in the same water mass. So to the extent that we can hold everything constant, we did. And basically, this is looking at, the, again, the nursery effect. So this is density of young of the year, all young of the year rockfish. If it's in blue, it's a platform. If it's in red, it's uh, North Reef. And you can see that in any given year, there's a lot of fluctuation. But in any given year, the densities at the platform are much higher uh, than at the natural reef. And, and, that, and it, that's clearly not because uh, the platforms have been sprinkled in fairy dust or, or something like that, right? Uh, it's because uh, of the size. So if I am platform Hidalgo, right, I go, I'm in four, uh, 150 meters of water. I go from the bottom all the way to the surface and above. And if I'm North Reef, my wallet, there I am, about four meters tall, right? So if I'm a, a little Boccaccio, I'm down there about 20 meters of water. I'm looking for something to settle out on. I don't care what it is, as long as it's hard. Who am I going to find? Big old Hidalgo or puny little North Reef. Very sad. And that's the reason, that's the reason that, in general, densities of rockfishes, young deer rockfishes, are higher at typical platforms than at typical reefs. Is that always the case? No. But most often it is the case. And I think it's purely a function of these pelagic juvenile rockfishes being able to find these big structures. Yes? Oh, because 99 was the miracle year. 99 was the but year. Oh, well, you, you may reach, um, well, I, I don't think it's like a either or thing. Uh, remember, a lot of these are like random events. So unpredictable events, unpredictable currents carrying uh, pelagic juveniles in one place and, and not another. Uh, there may be kind of a maximum density in any given year that a platform can sustain based on food coming in. Yeah, it, it, you can't go from one to another. Yeah, they're real close to each other. Yeah, I mean, the answer is, You'd have to be a Jesuit to know the answer to that. You'd have to be the new pope to be able to <laughs> respond to that question. And I am but a Jew boy, so what do I know? <laughs> so, so we're going to go back. We're going to look at uh, closer at this nursery function because I, I, I was like, after a number of years, I'm going like, wow, there's, in some years, there's a lot of juvenile rockfish around these platforms. But is this particularly important? So. So I, I picked w uh, one year, uh, which was, uh, I can't even remember now, 2004 or something, when we saw lots and lots of Boccaccio, juvenile Boccaccio. And uh, we actually estimated, instead of just densities, how many little Boccaccio are there around each platform? And we, I didn't have money to do all the platforms that year, but I had money to do the ones in the in the Eastern Channel. And so here's the total, uh, you know, I'm not saying it's to the, it's accurate to the fish, but uh, th this gives you a sense of, of, of how many uh, juvenile Boccaccio there probably were. And we came up with for these number of platforms, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, we got about 433,000 baby Boccaccio in one year. So then the question is, well, is that an important number? I mean, maybe that's in the scheme of things, that's, it seems large to me, but maybe it's not. 
So we asked this man, Alec McCall. Alec McCall at the time was uh, head of the National Marine Fisheries Service Boccaccio Stock Assessment. And actually, Alec it was acting in a video that I put together. He played the drunken night watchman very well, if you ask me. <laughs> and he ran the numbers through his uh, stock assessment model, none of which I understand. And he said, OK, 2003, uh, abundance of little Boccaccio at six platforms. Uh, the num the, that number of Boccaccio was 20% of the average yearly, young of the year Boccaccio abundance in their entire range, right? So I'm going like, well, God, that seems kind of important, right? And I said, but on average, how many adults does that turn into? Because that's what you're interested in, is uh, how, how much are you adding to the adult biomass? Because this is a very overfished species. And he uh, did whatever hanky-panky he does. And he said, again, those fish would contribute about 1% of additional adult, uh, adult Boccaccio needed to rebuild the stock. So that's, to me, that's a fairly important number. Six platforms in one year can uh, increase the adult population by 1%. Pretty, to me, that's fairly important. And that's the kind of thing that the people who have to decide what to do with platforms probably want to know one way or another. But, but again, is that every species of rockfish? No. Is that every uh, platform? No. It's just the ones that I looked at in that year for that species. So um, here I am talking to the uh, owners of the uh, oil industry, the, the giants, the captains of uh, industry, about my research. Clearly, they like my research. Seems to be very positive. Here I am talking to environmentalists. <laughs> Not so much. And uh, I actually have never, well, in 1996, I was invited to talk to uh, some environmental uh, leaders in Santa Barbara. That was the last time anybody in the environmental movement ever asked me to give a talk, which, because I walk on that side of the street, makes me feel kind of peculiar. But there you go. So, um, uh, and uh, not environmental people, but some of my colleagues have raised issues uh, about generalizing from that data. I remember uh, Mark Carr, most of you know Mark Carr? Does anybody, everybody knows Mark Carr. He's a professor at uh, UC Santa Cruz. And about 1998 or nine, we were at a conference and, and I said, Mark, I saw an estimated 400,000 uh, young of the year widow rockfish at Platform Hidalgo. I said, I think that, um, I think Platform Hidalgo may actually be producing fish, little widow rockfish. And he looked at me and said, how do you know that the next day all of those yois aren't dead? And because I'm an academic, I thought to myself, fuck you, Mark. <laughs> A position I hold to this day, by the way. <laughs> no, but I, so I said, I said, I, you'd have to be God to know the fate of every little rockfish. How am I? But it turns out that some of these qualms people have, you can, in a way, kind of begin to address. So I'm going to talk about addressing some of these issues that people have raised at one time or another. So the first one is, OK, 2003, you saw a bunch of uh, little Boccaccio at six platforms. Maybe in that year, maybe it was a fabulous year for uh, Boccaccio recruitment. Maybe they were like everywhere on all the natural reefs, right? So that's a valid question. So fortunately, I know lots of people who are doing uh, near shore surveys. And I called them up, and I go, you see any Boccaccio? And they, everybody is able to give me densities. And it turns out that, no, it wasn't a particularly good year. And these, all these zeros around most places, that's the number of, that's the density of Boccaccio people found in that year in near shore Boccaccio nursery grounds, which tends to be kelp beds. Things like that. That doesn't mean there weren't any. And then there were some there and some there, you know, a few. But nothing like the densities we saw at the platform. So again, it's one year. It's one fish. Does that, I mean, I, I, all I'm telling you is at least I address a little bit of that issue. You fool. Maybe they all die. That was, the, uh, that was Mark Carr's statement. So like, how do you address that? So it turns out, this is a little complicated, but it'll be fun once we get through it. Uh, it turns out that nature 
has had did a little experiment for me. So basically, this figure talks about Boccaccio at platform Gale. And it's based entirely on going around in the little sub and getting densities of Boccaccio of various sizes. Okay, so we have little ones, you know, the fives and tens and 15 centimeters, those are the young of the year, all the way up to these big ones, 65 and 70. So if you start, does this little thing work? Yeah. If you start in 1999, remember that was like the magic year, 1999. Up here, there was little rockfish everywhere and down there. So in 1999, by golly, there was a pretty good recruitment of little Boccaccio, okay? Come back the next year, mmm, they're not there, but, oh wow, those are probably the same ones. Oh, come back the next year, ooh. <laughs> next year, oh my god! <laughs> Following year, I'm going spilkus, as my mother would say. The older your mothers get, the more Yiddish they talk. I can barely understand my mother. She's like 93, and it's like two-thirds Yiddish. I'm going like, what the hell are you talking about, lady? So, there it is. And then something magical, something mystical occurred. So yeah, they're getting bigger, bigger, bigger. Oh, whoa, they're about the same size. So all of you have been in school long enough to tell me why they didn't grow much between 2003 and 2004. If you guys were scuba divers, I wouldn't ask you that question. But I have such faith in Moss Landing. OK, I have no faith in Moss Landing. <laughs> hmm? That was a crappy answer. <laughs> that was, no. <laughs> that just, that's embarrassing, Greg. So <laughs> look, basically, when, when fishes start to mature, their growth rate slows down because they're pumping energy into sperm and eggs, as should we all, as far as I'm concerned. And um, that's what happened here. Boccaccio uh, mature at five years, six years, something like that. And that's what they did there. So getting back to the original premise, you fool, they all die. Arguably, these fish here are, at least many of them, are the same as these fish here. That's the, that's the most reasonable answer. I mean, you could say, okay, all these fish died, and then this bunch of fish came from someplace else, and then they died, and then another one, and then uh, a lot of hand waving. That's too much hand waving. No hand waving is involved in that, the same group of fish. And then they mature and they're adults. So not only did they survive, but they survived to become adults, and they're now, we assume, uh, shedding gametes, right? That's a rhetorical right. You don't have to agree with me, that's what I think. And you can actually see the same thing starting to happen here. Maybe they're all stunted. So the rationale there is you see four or 500,000 rockfish, and sometimes uh, there's, there's more, all uh, eating plankton, that's what they're doing around the platforms when they're young of the year, uh, maybe there's not enough food, and maybe, sure, there are a lot of them, but they're not getting enough food. And if you compared their growth rates with the same species on natural reefs, you'd find that they were growing more slowly. So at least they were damaged in some way. So basically, uh, we looked at um, rockfish from four sites, uh, two uh, platforms in blue and two uh, reefs, and these are all young of the year. And basically, we looked at their daily growth rates. And it turned out that statistically, the platform fishes were growing slightly faster than the reef fishes. So like, does that answer the question? No, because there's lots of species of fish. There's lots of years. Uh, this is how much money I had. But at least in this year, at those platforms, those blue rockfish were not stunted. That's all we can say. Maybe if the platform were not there, all the Yoyo Boccaccio would recruit to a natural reef. That's a good one. So the principle there is, here I am. I'm a big old platform. Currents are wafting Boccaccio toward me. And then they hit the platform and they stick. If I was not here, maybe the current would have run to a natural reef and I would have stuck there. In which case, the platform just interrupted the flow. It didn't improve things any. So you can do uh, an interesting model. Uh, using CODAR, remember, CODAR is surface-directed uh, radar. You can look at, at current patterns. And uh, UCSB has uh, CODAR up in the Conception Arguello area that covers this uh, area. And there's platform Irene right there. Basically, you can then, uh, knowing the current patterns, you can put as many baby Boccaccio, pretend baby Boccaccio, 
into these currents, and you can see where they would be carried. You can put them anywhere you want. And basically, the rules were all we're, we care about are baby Boccaccio that would have hit the platform. If we remove that, where would they have gone, according to the model? And what we had set up was that um, if they got within, I think that's the 50 meter curve, yeah, 50 meter curve, we would just assume they survived, which is probably not true. They probably all mostly would have died anyway, because that's what happens. But we assume that. On the other hand, if they were wafted out to sea, we would assume they died. So you just run the model, and you can run you know, as many little baby Boccaccio as you want. And uh, what we found was in the three years we did it, and we only did it during the season where there are baby Boccaccio out there, and we found that 72, about 72% 72 of the baby Boccaccio, if the platform was not there, would have been wafted out to sea. Does that answer the question fully? No. One platform in three years, but it kind of helps address it. Maybe when the young Boccaccio leave a platform, they all die a terrible, terrible death. So if you look at most platforms, the Boccaccio um, recruit there, and within a year, they're gone. Gale is different because it's so deep that the fish, as they go deeper and deeper, which is what they do in, in natural situations, they can actually just go straight down to a, a depth that they're really comfortable with. Most platforms are in water that's so shallow, the, the Boccaccio go deeper, uh, usually around the fall of the year that they stick, and then they go like, whoa, this is really shallow, man, and they leave. You don't, you don't see them. So the question is, when they leave, yeah, there were a lot of them there, but when they leave, maybe they all die, right? So Fish and Game actually helped me out in this. So Fish and Game um, tagged little Boccaccio uh, at, at these platforms here back in the 78 to 81 period, and then years later, uh, anglers caught the adults uh, down in Santa Monica Bay and across here and up there. So at least not all of those baby Boccaccios died a terrible, terrible death. And then lastly, maybe they glow in the dark. So you, if you think about it, platforms are industrial sites, right? They're not playing pinochle on these things. They're drilling. There's drill mud that's coming off. Um, there's um, expressed water that may be coming off. It's supposed to be clean, but maybe it's not. So one might expect that fish living around platforms have higher levels of heavy metals, for instance, than the same species that are living on natural sites. So about four, uh, four years ago, um, MMS gave us money to collect fish, uh, three species of fish, from platforms and from natural sites that were away from the platform. And then we sent them all to a uh, USGS lab in Missouri, and they ran the numbers. And what we found, uh, here's basically you know, where we did, did the work. We found there was no difference. There were some interesting things, though. Uh, this is looking at um, kelp rockfish, uh, the, oops, the red ones, the little red dots, each one of those uh, symbols is a fish. The higher the, uh, the, the symbol is, the more mercury there was. And um, it turns out that the natural sites tended to have more mercury than the uh, platform sites, which are in blue. And th these two up here are, are actually higher than the action level that the federal government set. So you shouldn't actually be able to eat those fish. And they were from Santa Cruz Island. Well, does that mean that uh, Santa Cruz Island is like a pest pole of uh, mercury pollution? Uh, probably not. There are cinnabar, cinnabar deposits that contain mercury. They're probably eroding. And there's mercury getting into the water in the area, in the kelp beds. On the other hand, if you look at mercury in uh, sand dabs, the very highest one we saw was at a platform. But if you, you, know, if you graph this stuff and do the statistics, there is no difference, at least in heavy metals. And we actually also looked at PAHs, uh, which are organics. Um, there wasn't any difference between the sites. So um, what have we learned from this experience? Uh, three, distinct water fish, uh, three distinct fish assemblages, water column, which is composed of nearshore species, and uh, in particular, uh, nursery ground for rockfish. And the bottom and the shell mounds, water columns, many platforms serve as rockfish nursery grounds. The young of the year rockfish densities um, around many platforms are greater than those on most natural reefs, but not all of them. Interestingly, in Southern California, the natural reefs that have 
really high densities year after year after year of young rockfishes tend to be spires. The ones, uh, there's kind of stacks that are located off of uh, San Miguel Island, for instance, which kind of are act like, like platforms. They come way up off the bottom and they probably catch young uh, pelagic juvenile the same way that uh, platform does. Some platforms act as de facto marine reserves, not all of them. There's actually pretty heavy fishing pressure around the platforms off uh, Long Beach. Pro probably because historically, even before 9-11, there was a lot of fishing pressure and everybody was kind of good with that. Further north, they get squirrelier and squirrelier until once you're off of Point Conception or Arguello, like uh, no one wants you around. Uh, as with natural reefs, platforms probably produce and aggregate fishes. And, and you can tell that, or one way of, one way of looking at the production aggregation uh, question, and by the way, that's a question that has fed and supported biologists for like 40 years. Oh my God, if you get on the gravy train of production aggregation, uh, you'll never have to work again. So, um, uh, one, but one thing you can look at is, in, in terms of production or aggregation, if you only see adult fish of the particular species at a structure, whatever it is, uh, then it's harder to make the production argument because that fish had to come from someplace else. If you never see a juvenile of that species, it had to come from someplace else. If on the other hand you see juveniles, then you can at least say, well, maybe uh, the, th this structure, whatever it is, uh, helped produce these juveniles. Uh, they would not have survived without it. That doesn't mean it's always true, but you can at least make the argument. If you look at kelp bass, iconic uh, recreational species of Southern California, we never see juvenile kelp bass around a platform. They, they just don't recruit to the platform for whatever reason. So when we see, and sometimes we do, 1,000 or 2,000 adult kelp bass at a platform, they were not produced there. They came from other places. On the other hand, many of these rockfish species, arguably, when you see hundreds of thousands of these young ones, you can start to at least make, uh, you can uncomfortably make the assumption that, th that there's some production going on. And then, um, on average, fishes living around uh, platforms are neither more or less than contaminated uh, than fishes from natural sites. So I have five minutes. And I, 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 I want to tell you a story that shows you how weird it is doing this research on a, on a personal level. So about 19, uh, let's see, it was during the Bush administration, about 2005 maybe. I'm sitting in my office and I get a call and the guy goes, this Dr. Love? And I'm going like, yeah. He says, this is Jack Coleman. Dr. Love, I'm an attorney. I'm working for the House Subcommittee on Natural Resources here in Washington, D.C. And he said, uh, Congressman Vitter has submitted a rigs to reef bill, and uh, it's being heard in the subcommittee, and we'd like you to come and talk about your research. And uh, I actually didn't want to do it, so I semi-lied. I, I knew, he sa I said, what day uh, is it? And he gave me a date. It was a Thursday. And I knew that I had to give a talk at the Minerals Management Service on a Tuesday. But I lied. And I said, oh, wow, I got to give this talk on a Wednesday. And there's no time for me to get to DC. And I said, oh, that's too bad, Dr. Le. Gets off the phone. And then he calls the Minerals Management Service. <laughs> and he calls me back and he goes, good news, Dr. Le. <laughs> I go, OK. He said, I said, uh, are you going to pay my way? Oh, Dr. Love, how subcommittee on natural resources does not pay expert witnesses transportation costs. I'm, I'm thinking to myself, if I were Henry Kissinger, you'd pay my transportation costs. But I said, okay, whatever. So uh, I went there, and uh, it's actually kind of a trippy thing. Uh, these uh, hearing rooms, they're big, and all the Congress people uh, are in this big horseshoe shape, and you're down below them. You're given five minutes to testify. And uh, it started, and there was a number of us talking. Some people hated re reefs, and some people liked reefs. And I was the only one actually done any research, and uh, just the way it usually is. And um, over time, Congress people left, right? And at the end, when it was my turn, there was one person <laughs> there. But you know what? He laughed at my jokes, and uh, so I had a good time. But <laughs> the two days before. I left, I got an email from the Heritage Foundation, and they wanted me to, to, to give a talk there. Well, the Heritage Foundation, I don't know if you folks know, 
uh, is somewhere to the right of Genghis Khan. You know, and uh, uh, they walk not only on, on a different side of the street than I do, but uh, like in a different city. They're way over. All we have in common is we're carbon-based life forms. That's <laughs> kind of it. So, but I, you know what? I, I figured like hell. Uh, I get paid to tell people facts. I can go and give these Neanderthals uh, <laughs> facts, right? So I get there, and it's a long conference room, not very big. There's about 20, 25 people, and I'm not kidding. Other than one person, everyone there was old, male, white, and fat. There was a person from the Chamber of Com U.S. Chamber of Commerce, American Petroleum Institute, and there was a young black woman there. And I'm going like, is she their slave? I mean, what's like? Uh, so that was weird. And but uh, the first thing that made me kind of perk up was the the snacks were fabulous. I mean, they're really good snacks. And I think right wingers have more money for snacks than progressives do. So the snacks were good, so I started feeling good. And I started giving my talk, and um, they loved it. Of course they loved it, because it made the platforms look OK. And uh, told a few jokes, they laughed. I actually pulled up my shirt and showed them my tattoos. They went ooh and ah. And I'm going like, this is fun, right? I'm like, and then I thought about Arlo Guthrie's folk song, Alice's Restaurant. Most of you may be too young, you folks. Uh, Arlo Guthrie wrote this anti-war, anti-Vietnam War song about 1967, 18 minutes long. And in the song, which I will not take 18 minutes to repeat, he basically goes to Thanksgiving dinner in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Uh, his hostess asks him to drop off some garbage at the dump. The dump is closed, so he just throws it over the side of a cliff. right? And uh, a couple days later, Officer Obi, the local sheriff, uh, arrests him because they found the garbage and they found Arlo's name on an envelope. And so he's arrested for littering, right? And uh, so that's the first part of the song. Second part of the song is he gets drafted, gets a draft notice, has to go down for a physical, and he's going through the line. And uh, at the very end, they ask him, have you ever been arrested? And he says, yes, for littering. And they said, oh, you got to go to the Group W bench, right? So he trundles off there. And Arlo says, Group W Bench, with the mother raper and the father stabbers. Right? So there he is, sitting there with the mother. And he's kind of nervous. And then they all start playing with the pencils. They've been given pencils and scribbling and stuff. And Arlo, like, is having a great time with the mother rapers and the father. And all of a sudden, I realized I was having a great time <laughs> with the mother rapers and the father stabbers. So there you go. There's no moral there. It was just a. <laughs> Just a piece of my life. I lead a very quiet life, and I like to share it with uh, folks. So, anyway, that's uh, that's it. You've all been very brave. And if you have questions, questions are good. Questions are our friends. Questions? Other than Greg, no, Greg. Don't. I want to go back to the Picasso joke because it was just the way it was shown. When you really hear the excitement and engagement of the participants, they look to this amazing sort of backstory. Yes. And Yes. They could have. Yeah, I mean, that's the alternative hypothesis. They grow really fast, though. Absolutely. Of uh, yeah. e everywhere. I mean, they're one of the fastest growing rockfishes, other than these little ones, right. but of, of that size, they grow really fast. So they could have left. Yeah, now the abundance issue, that's a good point. So in some years, particularly about the fourth year, there's this big spike. And you're going like, what, what's happening? What happens there is that for the first three years, the, the fish are very reclusive. And they're staying inside the, the jacket or just barely on the outside. In the fourth year, they come out onto the shell mound. So you're seeing a lot of them. That, that we, we don't try to count the fish that are way inside. We only do two meters. So you're actually counting fish that it, whose behavior has changed. Very good, you get a gold star. <laughs> They're not as a scared. Yes. So you mentioned very well the idea of working in a region where water size has been cut and stuff. Um, what's the effect of that, particularly on the, the stability of the population? Yes. So that's a good question. And um, 
we don't know. Uh, there's actually an effect on who settles earliest because in a number of cases, I don't, I don't scuba dive, so this is from my divers. Jews can't dive because every time we go in the water, the water's part. <laughs> so I have to hire the goyim to, to do that. I can't even take a shower. I have to sandpaper myself. <laughs> water just goes off. So um, I, I, over the years, lots of people have said, you know that early recruitment of Boccaccio, they're eating the later recruits. And, and so there has to be an effect. Uh, but I mean, we haven't measured it, but I'm sure there's an effect. Yeah. Other? Yeah. Yeah. Here's the deal. Basically, the oil company signed a contract saying, uh, when we're done, we are going to remove this platform. The state of California, and, and what's happened in the Gulf of Mexico, where they have 4,000 approximately platforms, is that they've altered that so that the state can assume responsibility for as much of the platform as they want. But the oil companies are going like, hey, we're done. And if, if the state of Louisiana goes like, OK, we'll take that, um, they'll assume responsibility. But no one wants to assume the liability expense of something above the water where uh, somebody can jump off and die, and then the family sues. I mean, it becomes a liability. It becomes a hazard to navigation, things like that. Sure. And, and that's the topping. That's the topping issue where you cut it some number of meters below the waterline, and the Coast Guard says if you top something 40 feet below the waterline, you don't even have to tell us. You don't have to mark it on a chart. If, but the shallower you leave it, the more nav aids you have to put on it. There's a buoy, and then a buoy with a foghorn, and a buoy with a light. So it becomes an expense. Someone has to maintain the buoys. People like to go out and cut buoys, so. Not for environment. I was about to say too big a generality. There are a group of people <laughs> who don't care how many fish live around a platform. I gave a talk, the, that one talk I gave to a group of environmentalists in 97, like before I knew much, but I knew a little bit. And a, a person at the end of it uh, stood up and said, I don't care how many animals die. I want those platforms out of there. And, and I remember, I had never heard that before, now I've heard that over and over, but I, I was kind of stunned, and I remember saying, well, at least that's a coherent philosophy, <laughs> thinking to myself, yeah, but Hitler had a coherent philosophy too, <laughs> so I'm not sure coherence in and of itself is all that good. But um, th there, there are a group of people who would not respond to, to that logic, but there's a ton of people who, who do respond to that. The question is, at the end of the day, which side is going to win? I, my guess is some of those platforms, they'll do exactly what you said. They'll cut it someplace below the waterline and leave much of the reef standing, and, and, but remove the liability issues as far as uh, transit is concerned. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes? Yeah, you should be sorry. <laughs> Here's the deal. The oil companies uh, are contractually obligated to pay only for removal. If, based on laws now in Louisiana, Alabama, Texas, and California, if the state says, you know what, we like that platform, just cut it to 80 feet below the waterline, uh, the oil company is going to save money. Half of that savings goes to the state of California, half remains with the oil industry. So it's estimated, and this is I'm sure wrong by this time. It estimated that a decade ago, to remove all the platforms in California would be about a billion dollar exercise. I'm sure it's far more than that. So if you just said, okay, all you have to do is take the tops off, you're talking about the state acquiring a, like hundreds of millions of dollars in, in the savings the oil industry would, would generate. Yeah. yeah. Um, down to about, it, on most platforms, down to about 40 meters by about October. 
And then I don't know what they do because we don't go out there and we're not no deeper than that in the rest of the year. But when we come back the following year, the bigger fish are deeper or gone. You mean the following year? Yeah. At the one, only at, at Gale. Yeah, uh, th yeah that's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, th yeah. Um, you could actually, if you want to be higher tech, you could do acoustic tags and track them for years. Yeah. I mean, yes. And uh, I fear that the interest of the federal government has shifted to EMF fields around cables, which is our new, uh, what we're doing now. and and. Th there's no real interest in pursuing that question other than academics. Yeah. Who can come up with some money? <laughs> I'm just a hooker, man. I'll do anything. <laughs> so, any other question? I'll stick around. Yeah, thank you, guys. <laughs>